appeared on the landscape, following the valley of the Avon Vathu. James Swinton Spooner constructed a small masterpiece of Victorian technology, the Talithin Railway. The Tallinn Railway was built in the 1860s for both freight and passenger traffic from Tallinn to Abergenolwyn. It has a continuous record of service since 1865 and it is still using the two original locomotives and passenger rolling stock supplied at that time. Its chief attraction and its chief interest is the fact that it was the first railway in the world to be preserved by a society of amateurs, the Talatin Railway Preservation Society. This happened in 1951, following the death of the previous owner, Sir Hayden Jones, in 1950. When the society took over the railway and started to run trains in 1951, it found a railway line that had been neglected of the two locomotives only one was serviceable and the four carriages and a brake van had been in service for something like 85 years the track was rough uneven and a lot of the sleepers had rotted to the extent that it was the grass growing in between the rails that kept them in place there were occasional derailments but from an early date it was our policy to renew both rails and sleepers from one end of the line to the other. Bridges and the big viaduct at Dolgog also gave us problems. In the early years of the society it was chiefly pioneering work involving pick, shovel and muscle and we had considerable help from army territorial units to achieve this. Those days, some people say sadly, have now gone. Now it is a highly efficient railway requiring a considerable amount of professionalism in the volunteer force. The history of the Talatin Railway now spans 120 years and the last 30 of these have seen the dreams of a few people of vision brought into reality. Now what's it like running a railway? A lot of hard work, physical work certainly, and a few frustrations at times. But really it's great fun and we all thoroughly enjoy doing it. The railway has a permanent staff of 12 people, and, but it depends heavily on the enthusiasm and work done by volunteers. That's true, isn't it, David? Oh, yes, indeed. About 10% of the society membership. Well, we're in the control office at the moment, and this is where the railway is controlled from. Uh, control exists to make sure that the railway runs safely, efficiently and hopefully to time. The operation of the railway is recorded by means of a train graph which shows their journey up and down the line. But this is done in the control office and each train is, is colour coded according to the locomotive that's hauling it. This not only provides a record of each day's operation, but also gives a visual picture of where each train is, should the controller need to rearrange things in the event of a breakdown or of emergency.
Tumbling Railway starts in Tawin, which is on the shores of Cardigan Bay, and it runs through the town, uh, past the first station, which is called Pendray, which is really the engineering centre of the railway, where the locomotive shared workshops, carriages and so on are kept, and then strikes out through fairly flat countryside, and then begins to climb through a small intermediate station called Ridironan, which serves a small local population and also a holiday caravan site. From then on, the, the railway climbs gradually onto the hillside through uh, another small in intermediate station at Bring Glass, where there is a passing loop, it being the end of a token section. And then the line climbs up from Bring Glass towards Dolgoch through some wooded country to reach Dolgoch Falls stations where there is a series of walks around the waterfalls uh, and which is a pleasant spot where a lot of people either just travel to or break their journey on the way up the line. From Dolgoch upwards the line is then really on a ledge on the hillside looking down into the valley below. Uh, there is another uh, token station and a passing loop at a little place called Quarry Siding and another two miles or so the main uh, upper station of Abergenolwyn is reached. This is quite an extensive station with a, a passing loop, a uh, signal box and a fairly large station building which incorporates a refreshment room and shop. And then the line leaves Abergenolwyn to curve round into the Nantgwernal ravine itself from where there are a series of forest walks through the forest land in the area. This is the key token instrument which controls a single line from here to Pendry. There are a list of official bell codes, but there are also a number of unofficial bell codes one of which uh, tells the blockman at the other end of the section that the general manager is entering the section. On one occasion, I had gone up the line and the, on the train and the bell code had been duly passed on, but I confused the issue by getting off at an intermediate station and walking back to signal box. When I got there, the bell code general manager out of section was just given, much to the extreme embarrassment of the signalman on duty. This is one of a pair of instruments, coloured yellow, the other one being at the other end of the section at Pendry. And from Pendry onward, there is another pair for the section, one at each end to bring glass, which are coloured red. My job at a block post involves controlling the movement of the trains away from the main station at Tarion to authorise a train to pass this block post into the next section and be sure that the section is clear for the train to do so. When we want to take a token out, we've got to get in touch with the blockman at the far end and that's done with the, the bell push there and then, excuse me again, a one beat on the instrument calls his attention and then I will tap out a code which describes the type of train that I'm asking him for permission to send to him. Um, normal passenger train, it's 3-1. And he should then reply the same for me and give me a release to take the token out. And then I acknowledge that to him to say, I've got the token, it's OK and this is then handed to the driver. No more tokens can now be taken out at either end. It's a safety device. And the train will go through the section and hand it in at the far end. The points which a train crosses in what's known as the facing direction, when it can actually take one or other direction, have to be locked for a passenger train running over them. If I want to reset the road for a train to pass one which has already arrived, then I've got to unlock the point before I can move the point and then relock it again. And that won't now move. And 
the same procedure in reverse. When the society first started, they took over the old line more or less as it was with the existing old rail, which was extremely well worn. There's continuous maintenance, literally, you know. You can sort of lay a, a section now, as the years go by, go down right the way through the line and say, right, well, that's it, we finish this, and then you go back to the other end and find like, something might be worn. Our peak, with, with heavy traffic, lasts about six, seven, eight weeks at the most. So the actual running life of the rail is extended by the fact that we don't run a heavy peak traffic for 12 months of the year, like British Rail do, you see, we're seasonal. Our major heavy projects, like complete rail, complete sleeper changes, are generally done in the winter. And the evening peak service, we can still work on the track. There's any amount of jobs we can actually do. If the first place rust, and you get terrific heat, obviously no metal expands, this is where you get the buckling in the rail. We use a, a, a special grease called cardium, which has to be preheated, and this lubricates the fish plates. So that when you tighten up, it's such a thick, greasy oil that with the expansion and contraction, although it's tight, it actually moves. It's almost like something going between the rail and the fish plates. We've been fortunate with the closure of the, the channel tunnel scheme, as was. The rail came from there, a lot of the rail, good rail, came from there. And we also had sleepers as well, which were um, elms, which didn't survive very well in our climate here, like a hydrolysis sets in. Although we get our Jarra sleepers usually from, or, from Australia, they're delivered all the way from Australia to Southampton. So in fact, we've just recently picked up some uh, second-hand good BR sleepers, and we've got them stacked on the wharf edge here, about 150 of them. The standard gauge is literally double our narrow gauge, we're two foot three. Well, if you cut them actually straight down the middle, that was two sleepers out of one. These kangos that we use, the kangaroo ballast tampers actually they're called, they usually get one man on one side of a sleeper, one man on the other side of a sleeper, and you work together. It's a spade-shaped angular, it's about 15 degrees, and it simply pushes the ballast underneath the sleeper. We had a volunteer start here, he only hadn't been here all that long, I can't exactly remember his name, but I think he was a trainee guard. And he came to us one day when we were at a station doing a job or something like that, and he says, it seems strange, he says, well, I'm, when I'm in the guard van and we go past, you're always standing there doing nothing. And, uh, of course, as we said to this chap, well, um, if we were to continue working on the track as the train was going through, what would happen to us? He just looked at us and said, oh, yes, I'd never thought of that. I started on the telethon when I was about 13 years old. And I started off as a trainee guard, which involved training for two or three years to become a guard. Uh, I was quite surprised that at an age of about 13 or 14, I was able to get involved in actually operating a railway rather than looking at it or, or collecting numbers. Probably a, a lot of people think guarding a train is just waving a flag. Uh, in fact, it involves a lot more than that. Uh, a typical guards day would start about 8 o'clock in the morning with an hour and a half or two hours spent preparing the train. That means sweeping the train out, uh, wiping the seats over, washing the windows, putting brasso on the handles, uh, cleaning the running boards and a few other bits and pieces. And then guarding the train, although the primary function of the guard is the safe running of the train and attempting to run the train to time, there are so many other activities that the guard is involved in. Um, perhaps the most obvious one is simply helping the passengers on and off the trains and making sure they have the, the information that they need for their journey. Uh, a big part of the training is where the staff are encouraged to see public relations as one of their main ideals. And uh, I think we're very conscious we're dealing with holiday makers and not just passengers. And therefore, 
we, we hope they'll actually enjoy their, their experience on the railway and not just see it as a journey from A to B. One of the things that, that the guard has to do, of course, is, is to book tickets from, from the brake van. If it's the, uh, the main summer season, then most of the stations are staffed and the guard rarely has to issue any tickets. If it's out of season, like in May, June, September and October, the guard can really be quite busy. Um, during, say, a two-minute station stop, he might find himself having to issue as many as 20 or 30 tickets. Yes, Occasionally things go wrong. Uh, I've, I've known an assistant guard accidentally drop the change he was giving to a passenger between the footboard and the platform. But it, it's very rare. I mean, our, our training program tries to stress guards appearing to be efficient, even if they're not. I'm sure the vast majority are. To be a guard involves perhaps a three or four year training program. And uh, quite apart from the experience that all the assistant and trainee guards build up, we expect each guard, well, certainly to, to pass a test on, on the rules of the railway, but also to have carried out some emergency procedures. So should the worst ever happen in terms of a train failure, uh, every guard we're really convinced will be uh, well equipped to deal with that emergency. Um, I started working on the railway in 1966 in the shops and on the refreshment counters. After about three years, I thought I would like to join the men on the railway and do the sort of things that they do. Um, I started off by becoming a guard after about three years, then went on to do signalling on the railway, booking clerk, running stations. Uh, I'm now the training officer of the railway as well and I've started working in the loco department. Is the next train 2.30? That's right. Apart from booking all these yes. tickets for the various trains and to the various stations and journeys, we also give out information on our own railway, all the That's Great Little right. Trains of Wales and British Rail as well. That's Most correct. of our so trade is done with turn. tourists That's and right. holiday That's makers. Right. But there are still one or two people who live up the line at outlying farms and perhaps come down here uh, to do their shopping maybe once a week. Uh, there's one elderly lady who gets on at Riddy Ronan every Friday, comes down to town, does her shopping and returns by an afternoon train. So we do get some local traffic but they're mainly from the smaller stations along the line. Obviously passengers often cause a giggle here and there. People don't realise this is the Talatoon Railway and not British Rail. So we sometimes get the odd passengers saying, can we have returns to Mahuncliffe? The other one that often crops up is, um, can we take the dog on the train? And having told them they can if they pay for it, they say it's only a little dog, so we reply, well, it's a little ticket, you know, that sort of thing. It doesn't matter what you do on the railway, obviously, you have to be trained to do it. When I was first asked to be training officer, I felt like saying no thank you because I don't know everything about the railway. But being training officer, you get other people to do the training for you. So in different departments, there are different people doing the training for that particular job. Um, for instance, if somebody wants to go out and work on the track, then obviously the regular track gang give them their training. Um, the same thing if you want to train as a guard, you are put on a train as an assistant guard. The guard does a certain amount of that training and the rest is followed up by the training officer at mutual improvement classes and winter seminars and training weekends, practical training weekends, that is. And as far as ladies are concerned, they, are, they go through the same system as the men on the railway and we're all equal. No special treatment whatsoever. <laughs> There's one lady at the moment who is working this season, who is the outdoor working party organiser, and she is actually organising a lot of the work that's going on at the line and work around Pendre as well. When I initially came on the railway, I worked with my father up and down the line looking after the stations, mending seats and making litter bins, and generally doing small jobs. And then I fancied to go on the engines, and me and my friend were two of the first girls to work on 
the engine side of it for a long time and there was a bit of resistance at first but I think we're quite accepted now. There's quite a few girls work on the railway. It's not all glamour, it's quite hard work and you have to take it seriously but you manage to get a lot of fun out of it at the same time. While I'm not working on the engines, there's plenty of jobs to do around, which I still get a lot of pleasure out of, small jobs that you can get a lot of satisfaction of seeing the end result with. I think that's the pleasure of working on the railway, is seeing a job through, doing something completely different from your own normal work. Each engine is different to fire, but I think my preferences change every time. Every summer I come down, somehow I get attached to one engine. I always used to like firing number one. She wasn't the easiest one to fire, but I used to get the most enjoyment out of it. But obviously, I uh, can't fire number one this summer. Number one, Talith Lynn, was built back in 1864 by Fletcher Jennings in Whitehaven as a four coupled industrial tank locomotive. It was very unsatisfactory and within a matter of months it had to be taken out of service, went back to the makers and had an extra pair of wheels fitted under the rear end on a rigid frame. And in that form it ran for the next 70 odd years but by that time it was in a pretty advanced state of decay and it was laid aside until after the Preservation Society took over and then was completely rebuilt to the extent that there's very little of the original left. Since the Preservation Society took over and we're running much heavier passenger trains than the old people ever did, of course the engines have had to work much harder and we've reopened the Nant Gwynel extension which is much more sharply curved than the remainder of the railway and we ran into difficulty with the engine being a rigid frame but the wheelbase was too rigid and too long for the sharper curves so we're now in the process of a second rebuild to provide side play on the treading wheels to enable the engine to get around the curves Dolgoch, the second engine, came from the same makers as Talith Lynn, Fletcher Jennings this engine is a four-wheeler but with a very long coupled wheelbase of six foot six unlike Callis Lynn, which only had four feet cut of wheelbase. And with the extra length of wheelbase, it rides quite steadily. It ran pretty much in its original form right up to 1953. It was the only engine in the early days of the Preservation Society. It maintained the entire service in 1951, although it was in a pretty bad state of repair. But uh, it was taken out of service after 1953, and it was sent away for rebuilding to a firm in the Midlands. It has a very peculiar valve gear, Fletcher's patent motion, which is a modification of Allen's straight link motion, whereby the valves are operated by eccentrics on the leading axle, and the whole valve gear is folded up so that it occupies a space only about three feet long. Um, very compact, very inaccessible, and it contains a geometrical nonsense in that the engine cannot be notched up to run at the earlier cutoff settings and it is therefore not really suitable for a mainline engine. Probably all right for an industrial loco that never goes very far. The two Corris engines, of course, came to us in 1951. They were in a pretty bad state of repair. They had been, in fact, condemned by British Rail, who owned the Corris Railway, uh, with some justification, as it turned out. Number three, Sir Hayden, is uh, the older of the two. She was built in 1878 by Hughes of Loughborough. Like Tanith Lynn, uh, built as a four-coupled engine, and sometime later, a pair of trailing wheels added to improve the riding on the sharply curved line at Corris. And it has not needed a great deal doing to it. We have modified the cab to make it more suitable for modern conditions, but it still has the original 1878 frames. It's really the only engine on the railway that can be described, the historic engine anyway, that can be described as original, whereas the, the old TR engines are little more than replicas, using a few original parts. Number three still has its original frames and cylinders and wheels and motion. New boilers, of course, from its third now, as far as we know. And then the other one, Edward Thomas, 
a Kerr Stewart standard industrial design built in 1921 in Stoke-on-Trent. We've not done a great deal to it, a few minor details, but effectively it is still the same engine that was built in 1921. The last working engine is Douglas, uh, not six, built by Andrew Barclays during the latter part of the First World War for government service was used on a short industrial railway on the RAF station at Calshot near Southampton up to the end of World War II and then laid aside. It passed through the hands of the dealer Abelsons in Birmingham and came to the Telethlin in 1953, was re-gauged from two foot to two foot three and arrived on the railway after rebuilding in 54. Of course, there's always in the background number seven, Irish Pete, as some people call it, uh, the second Barclay engine, which we obtained from Borden and Mona in Era uh, back in 1969. It's about half built at the moment, regaging from three feet to two foot three. New frames have been built here, and we've reused the original cylinders, wheels, and boiler, but everything else will be new. With three diesel, two Rustons. The number five is a much older machine, 1940 vintage, with mechanical transmission, three speeds. Whereas number eight is a, one of the last engines Rustons built before they gave up locomotive manufacture in 1964, and she's only 20 years old now. And uh, number eight has hydrostatic transmission, which is infinitely variable speed from naught to maximum in both directions. Very useful for permanent way work for, for example, hedge cutting, grass cutting, where you want to sustain low speeds. Then the third locomotive, the big Hunslet, ALF, number nine, a uh, coal board machine, standard Hunslet, designed for underground use. It was a two foot three gauge locomotive, the only one we've never had to re-gauge, and it's now undergoing its first complete overhaul. So it's off its wheels, major engine repairs, actual box repairs and so on. Well, back in 1951, this shop building was just the si same size and everything as it is now, but there was no whitewash on the walls, there was no concrete on the floor, and uh, there was certainly no machinery worth talking about. Uh, there had been back in the 19th century, and uh, there are still one or two slate slabs on the floor which are old machine bases. Uh, in the middle of the shop there was the remains of a circular saw, but I don't think that had worked for 20 years. And uh, there was a very ancient oil engine in the back corner of the shop, which again was rusted solid and quite unworkable. So we started from scratch. There was no electricity, of course, no electricity at all. Nowhere on the road. And uh, the first season, 1951, I didn't have much to do with the workshop myself that year, but uh, there was very little scope for doing anything other than uh, hammer and chisel work. The um, workshop contained a lot of junk. There were a large number of wooden barrels containing an incredible mixture of broken bolts and split nuts and just junk. And the floor was earth, apart from up the far end, which is um, old slate slabs, which we replaced with concrete. And the earth half of the shop, it was used well, old Peter Williams's chickens uh, scratched around here most of the time. There were usually half a dozen hens scratching around. So it wasn't a place you could do much useful work at all. And we've built it up gradually. We got the electricity in in 52, single phase. But it was about another four or five years before we put any machines in at all. Um, we had a six-inch lathe and a pillar drill, and that kept us going quite well. We could do a lot of work with that. We did have a welding set back in 52, and that really what kept the railway going more than anything else. Just before I came here on the staff in 63, we put in three-phase power with a decent-sized switchboard, and we were able to start thinking about buying respectable second-hand machinery from uh, industry machines that were not so old and uh, what you see now up and down the shop has all been bought within the last 10 or 15 years. Some of the machines are quite old. Uh, the lathe at the far end of the shop is pre-war 
1935 vintage or thereabouts, but it's never had much use, it's still accurate, and for our purposes, more than adequate. But nowadays, we can tackle pretty well everything, except the very largest wheels, which we still have to send out for machining, and major boiler work. We're not equipped to roll boiler plates or anything like that. We have a very good small team of skilled workshop men on the staff and a very small number of workshop volunteers who know what they're up to. The driver of this engine yesterday complained that the drain cut which I'm now replacing leaked. So this morning we have repacked it and are now replacing it on the engine in the hope that it won't leak again. Drivers have a report form each day, which they fill in after the engine has come back on shed. They list all the defects which they have found, minor ones, and with a bit of luck, late at night or first thing in the morning, these things are attended to. Fortunately, at the weekends, there are only two engines in steam, so we have a couple of spares and we can take our time at getting these things right. We fabricate virtually everything. 10, 15 years ago, we were building a fleet of new carriages, for example, and we built all the bogies here. The carriage bodies were done on contract outside. And now, after a period of years, all these bogies are having to come through the shop for reconditioning. And in addition to the railway work, of course, we take on work for other people in the district. We're always happy to help local farmers, and uh, June and July, hay time, there's mowing machines come in almost by the dozen. And again, the local factories, uh, we've done a lot of work for them, and uh, we've become quite experts in things like toffee extruding machinery. We're always happy to oblige, as long as we've got the materials available. And it's all good for local community relations. Of course, in addition to the mechanical engineering, there's a great deal of carpentry, woodwork, carriage finishing, a department which is very largely um, volunteer orientated, and uh, they do an extremely good job with limited resources. The high standard of paintwork that one sees on the railway is entirely due to a small band of volunteers. Uh, we have a paint shop which is insulated and heated and suitable for winter work, which has enabled a better standard of finish to be achieved than we used to manage in the old shed before we had any heat. Well, the majority of our carriages now are built to a standard design, but we have a few historic vehicles. There are two which were rescued from farms which had previously been in use on the Glen Valley tramway. And then the third historic vehicle came off the Corris Railway, and we found it in a garden somewhere near Oswestry. Unlike the Glen Valley coaches, which were very good, the Corris coach was in a very poor state. And over a couple of years, a small group of volunteers built what amounted to a replica, incorporating a few of the original parts. Uh, it's a saloon, centre entrance. It's been used for a number of special functions, including the Prince and Princess of Wales who travelled in it in 1982. But of course, there's always a considerable amount of maintenance work. Things have improved greatly. The standards of maintenance are vastly higher than they ever were in the 50s or even earlier than that. And uh, also, of course, the skill of the engine crews has increased considerably and it is virtually unheard of now for engines to be short of steam, unless we happen to get a bad batch of coal and a lot of tinker. Let's go. 
started working on the telethon back in 1974 when I was just 14 years of age and probably not of use to anybody. I started off as a cleaner, which would mean coming in early, cleaning the engine, and if I did a good job, I'd get a ride up the line with the driver and fireman to see how they do their work, and occasionally getting a go with the shovel. Four or five years later, I got a chance to do some firing myself. And as I became more competent at the job, I got more and more firing turns. I now hold a fireman's grade card, and I'm occasionally allowed to drive passenger trains under the instruction of the driver. The day begins at a horribly early time for me, because I hate getting up in the morning. Coming into the shed sometime between 6 and 8 o'clock, we have to shovel the ash out of the smoke box at the front of the engine and shovel the dead fire out of the firebox at the back of the engine, check we have enough water in the boiler, and then light a fire in the firebox, building it up with wood at first, then adding coal as the fire becomes hotter, and raising steam in about three hours, ready to work the train. Uh, we would get the engine thoroughly cleaned at that time as well, with one or two cleaners to help us during the school holidays usually, and bring the engine down, sparkling clean, about three hours after we started. I first came here in 1964. Uh, much to my pleasure, I was allowed to clean the locos and eventually, after the firing for some years, became a driver. Mind you, my footplate experience dates back to the early part of the war. As a youngster, I used to fire on some of the mainline engines purely uh, by invitation of the railwaymen that I knew at that time. The driver's day involves arrival at the shed in good time before the engine is leaving it to ascertain that it's being correctly prepared, that uh, sufficient steam to work down onto the empty stock. The driver would normally oil up the engine, check round and ensure that uh, all the working parts are intact. We'll get down to wharf about half an hour before we're due to leave and I'll then have to aim to get the fire well burnt through, nice and hot, without too much smoke, and full pressure, just below where the safety valves start to lift, ready for the climb out of wharf. There are as many different ways of firing one of our engines as there are different firemen. The most important thing is to keep the fire hot enough all the time, because there's very little reserve of steam in our boilers. You may have plenty of steam, but if the fire isn't hot enough, once you set off up the line, the pressure can drop very quickly. The steepest grade is from the lower part of the line, near Tarin. They're the most spectacular, where the engine has to work hardest, but they're usually fairly short. So if you do get things slightly wrong, you can pull the pressure around when you get to the top of them. A little bit further up the line, above Bryn Glass, it's a very long, continuous pull. And if you don't have your fire right as you leave Bryn Glass, then you'll be in trouble when you're halfway there. A good fireman will aim to keep the pressure as constant as possible, because that makes the job easier for the driver. Although the guard is in charge of the train, the driver has an overall responsibility. He has the lives of perhaps 100, 200 people in his hands, and the driver's job is to ensure that, as far as possible, the trains run to time, that he observes the speed limit, that he observes all the signals, ensures that the points are correctly set, and in effect to not only enjoy his trip up the line each time but that it's carried out efficiently and should we say competently. Another aspect of the fireman's job is to make sure that we have the correct token on the engine before we enter each section. The fireman will collect this token from the blockman and there'll be a verbal check with the driver to make sure that we have the right token for the section we're going into and also that we're handing back the token to the blockman for the section we've just left. There are firemen who will tell you they've never had a bad trip, and believe me, they're lying. We've all had our bad trips. The trick is knowing how to pull yourself round when you've done it. I've had the pressure so low that we've had to use full regulator to get up the banks. But we got there. We always seem to get there somehow. One of the problems that we do have on the railway, unfortunately, is the frequent presence of sheep. Lambs force their way through any holes they find in hedges. Invariably the ewes follow them and after a while you'll find that the holes in the hedges get bigger and bigger and ultimately you get flocks out on the line. We have always had trouble with sheep but it wasn't the only problem for the drivers in the old days, was it Hugh? Well, uh, the last years after Edmund we did not watch, me and the, the fireman did not watch. 
Og jeg, jeg husker selv at han de valgte om han inn i den cottage opposite upper station. Var det time Mrs. Jones and she showed at it was half an hour late one time. <laughs> So we asked that Thomas was asking where we've been. Oh, the, the, the truck, truck, gone off the truck. <laughs> it was only myself and my younger son when, when Sreden died. That's a lot there was on the railway. Oh, I liked her, but too, she was the old favorite of the old drivers. Yeah. She wasn't very long out. She, it was number one that was mostly out in Sreden's time. Oh, I used to like the six very much, but I took the number three when I went poorly. It wasn't shaking so much. <laughs> the best engine is something we managed to argue about for hours and hours here. My favourite is number three, Sir Hayden. And it's been my favourite since I did my first phone trip on her in 1978. There isn't really an engine which is a best steamer and a worst steamer. They all steam properly if you handle them properly. Number three has got a good loud exhaust and sounds wonderful working hard up the banks. Some people don't like having to work an engine that hard. They prefer one of the more powerful engines like number two. My favourite engine, of course, must be number one. It uh, is a delightful machine. In the absence of number one, my next favourite must, of course, be number two. Even though it doesn't suit my height, it has a very low cab. But nevertheless, it was built in 1866. It was the, the other original engine, and it runs number one very close as my favourite. The whistles on the locomotives each have their distinctive tones. Number two has a Caledonian hooter. In effect, it's somewhat like a, a factory hooter. Number three has the whistle off a BR Britannia locomotive. And number four has a pair of Great Western Castle whistles. And number six has Sparrowhawk that was an A4 on the LNER Eastern region. <laughs> there is considerable interest from passengers. They seem to admire the footplate crew, they seem to regard the drivers as achieving a boyhood ambition. be running a little early. It's not unknown for the driver to stop the train and dash in the field, pick half a dozen or so mushrooms and leap back to the engine. On one occasion the passengers seemed somewhat alarmed and said, oh, we've got a train to catch on BR. I said, that's all right, you'll be all right. They said, but won't we be late? I said, no, you'll be thankful I'm only picking mushrooms. You'd be much later if I was picking blackberries. Whether we have a good trip on the engine or a bad trip on the engine, the public can really tell the difference. We always aim for a high standard, though. We always aim to do the job as well as it can be done. It also helps if you know the driver. Now, I've worked with Morris many times, and I know how he drives the engines, so it's easy for me to fire to his way of driving, plan when you're going to use the injectors to put water into the boiler, when he's going to ease the regulator to ease the engine around the corners, then you can put on a bit more coal, for example. It just makes the whole job a lot easier. Not only do we enjoy a very happy team relationship on the footplate, but this extends throughout all departments, in fact, of the railway. We're a happy band, and this um, involves both the traffic side, with the blockmen, the guards, the station staff, 
those of us who are fortunate enough to be on the footplate, but also those who maintain the track, maintain signals, and telegraph installations, and do all the thousand and one other jobs that are involved. I think that the telethon has got something really very, very special that makes some of the volunteers come back year after year. Perhaps the, the biggest thing is, is the friendly nature of all the staff. Uh, no matter how new and inexperienced you are, most of the volunteers are really made to feel welcome. The idea of being involved with passengers and people out to enjoy themselves on holiday, plus being able to keep running uh, the, the railway that must be about 120 years old now, is, is the really enjoyable thing about it. But more than both those two ideas, the fact that volunteers have such a big part to play in the railway. Volunteers here are not simply a supporters club. Uh, the volunteer really is so much involved that he, he makes the decisions on, on the council of the railway. He operates the trains, drives the locomotives, all, all aspects of the railway. I've been to most of the preserved railways in this country and for me this one's got more character than the others. It's got an atmosphere of its own that the others haven't got. It's just the right size. It isn't too much like hard work firing the engines, but it's still a real challenge because we've got small engines working hard, doing the kind of job they're supposed to do. Well, of course, we have the whole of the original railing stock of the railway, supplied in 1866-67, uh, four carriages and a guard van. I don't think any other company in the country can claim that they have the whole of their original rolling stock from the 1860s. It's perhaps it's unique. There is also, of course, the added satisfaction that we have a first-class bunch of volunteers. The railway doesn't only stop on the railway but you will find that there are many social attractions. You get together in the local hostelries, the pubs, the Corbett Arms Hotel and so on. And it becomes a very close community, very friendly in all departments. And this atmosphere is reflected in our communications with the passengers who tend to regard us as being the friendly railway. <laughs>